managing your yard during the stress of the summer. That's what this the focus of this video is. It's different than my, one of my, my previous video of preparing. Now we're managing. So here's what we're going to go over. We're going to go over, got some notes. We're going to go over weed control this time of year, mowing this time of year, managing summer dormancy. We're going to go over exactly what's going on with your plant. We're going to go over cultural practice like mowing, uh, 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 dethatching, airification, all of those and what we should and shouldn't be doing. Fertilization, iron applications, we're going to talk about that for a minute. That's actually going to be my next video. Uh, evapotranspiration rate as far as irrigating and what's going on with as far as the water or your grass. And fungicide applications, what the grass is doing and a little bit of turf species selection because this is the time of year. If you're not happy with the way things are going, it's a good time to start thinking about and talking about different turf species and what you're actually putting in your yard. So let's do a real quick of what's going on as far as with the plant during the summer. Okay, this started in mid-June. We have had more 90 degree days in the last week or so than we had all the last year. In addition, it's been dry. This is not a fungus. This is a natural defense mechanism. I'll get into the plant physiology of that here in a moment. But this is a natural response when a yard is not irrigated. Now we're talking about irrigation here for a second. In order for you to avoid summer dormancy, you can use wetting agents, which I have talked about in, my, in a number of videos. They are excellent to, to prevent localized dry spots and to fend off summer dormancy. Okay. However, if you are not watering, there is no way to prevent this. And your choice is this when you're talking about watering. Are you willing to, from those of you out west, probably early May through probably the middle of October, are you willing to have a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollar water bill in order to prevent this? Or are you just going to roll with it, take what Mother Nature gives you, and work with the grass natural defenses? that has evolved into the turf in order to survive the summer. Are you going to work with nature here? That is your choice. Either a couple hundred dollar water bill or work with nature. Now, the one thing you do need to do, we've got summer dormancy, which is what we have here. We also then also don't want to have the grass die. How do we avoid that? University of Purdue, University of Michigan, I'll leave links to both of those publications below, how you're going to avoid dying from drought stress, particularly in cool season grasses and in warm season grasses for some of you that are somewhat sensitive, um, depending on where you are, particularly in the, in the Southwest, you will need to put at least a half of inch of water on your yard they say every two weeks. There again, we're talking Purdue, we're talking Michigan, we're talking cool season grasses. Those of you at West, I would say you would probably need to do that at least every 10 days, not 14 days, every 10 days, a half inch of water. Get in the physiology of that here in a minute. But that's what your choice is. This is not disease. And really why I'm stressing this is I'm seeing a lot of YouTubers. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of posts online of doing things to the grass that is going to solve this. The only thing that's going to solve this is you irrigating it. And the only thing and the decision you have to make is are you going to pay the water bill? That's it. And do you have a good irrigation system that can deliver a uniform application of water there, okay? That is the crown of the plant. Very similar to what a human body does when it's in hyper hyperthermia, what happens is your arteries, start, arteries and blood vessels start to restriction and you lo start losing your fingers and toes. And what does the body do? The body keeps blood going to your main arteries in your brain or your, your organs in your brain, keeping you alive. That's kind of what this plant is doing. First thing it does is it starts getting brown. It stops sending water to the leaves. That's why it goes brown. It is not dead. It is summer dormancy. Okay, but we're going to talk about how to manage that 
or and or avoid it here in a little bit. But that's what's going on. That plant is doing everything that it can to keep that crown alive. I see a lot about weed control. And granted, it doesn't look good. You've got, obviously, dormant grass coming in. And then you have weeds, like this Dallas grass here, which Dallas grass is a perennial, and it is a pain in the butt to take care of. There's not a whole lot of herbicides, particularly for cool season grasses, that will control Dallas grass. And we have a little bit of nut sedge right here. I'm going to show you something. This is Roundup, okay? Mixed up a glyphosate product, and I've shown you this in the other video, the sponge method of application. What you're going to do, you're going to take advantage. See how much taller this is than the, than the desirable grass? All you're going to do, give that a little spray with Roundup, kind of saturate it, give it a little shake to make sure it's not getting on, and then you're just going to dab it on there just like that. And see, you're not getting the grass. You're out here treating what actually needs to be treated. You can see the leaf blades getting wet. That's dead. Okay, that's actually probably the best method to control Dallas grass in particular. We've got nut sedge here. We're going to control that. And I am not harming or taking a risk of harming my grass with a herbicide. Okay, in the, when you're getting in in July and August, first of all, blend of chlorac, um, sulfurazone. All these other uh, herbicides, particularly for controlling crab crabgrass, they are not going to work in July. They're going to take multiple applications if they work at all. Quinaclorac in particular, I've seen that on a few YouTube videos. They say, oh, use it. The thing is, is this. It will only, as I said in my herbicide video, it will only control crabgrass at the three-tiller or less stage or after it is matured at the five tiller or more. Okay. And three tiller is kind of sketchy. Basically dates about probably the 4th of July to August 15th. Clinical is not going to do you a bit of good. The only thing you're going to do is risk hurting your grass. This is probably the best method. It's going to be hard to do it on crabgrass because it generally grows fairly low, but for nut sedge, Dallas grass, and other grasses that grow higher, this is the best method. Don't put any herbicide out, particularly on cool season grasses. Warm season grasses, yes, you can put out Celsius and just a little bit of a, I actually called bear on this. You can put out Celsius on warm season grasses above 90 degrees. They recommend at 90 degrees or more not to use a non-ionic surfactant, okay? That will control the majority of weeds that you have. It'll suppress Dallas grass. Won't do a great job on it. Um, so anyway, those are basically your options. You may have a few more. But if you have done, and this is, I'll maybe say this a couple times. If you, if you subscribe and hit the bell on this channel, I will give you a heads up of when to be doing things. So if you've put a good pre-emergent herbicide down, you shouldn't have a whole lot of trouble with crabgrass, goosegrass, some a little bit of nut sedge. Dallas grass, not so much. You'll probably have to use a sponge method to take care of it because it's a perennial and it will, it'll already be there, so to speak, and the pre-emergent won't control it. So anyway, there again, and I keep on saying this and I'll say it throughout the video. Right now, we're in cruise control. We're just getting through the, don't do anything fancy, don't do anything stupid, just let the grass Row. Okay, so mowing. Anytime you mow grass, it's detrimental to the turf. Period. It is injury to the turf. Period. I do not recommend mowing your yard when it is under stress. When if it's dry, don't mow it. It may be a week, it may be two, it may be more. Don't mow it. The reason being is one, it's shutting down, particularly cool season grass, folks. The plant is shutting down. It's not growing that much. It may be uneven. Fine, live with it. Grow with it, baby. Just let it go. Because if you go out and mow it, you're going to damage it. You're going to stress it further. And you're going to push more of it into summer dormancy if you don't want that. Um, also, I had a yard I did, redid for a guy. Came in real good in the spring, did it for him in the spring, came back, 
drove past the house about this time of year, and sure enough, it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and dust was a-flying, because he was out mowing his yard at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was 95 degrees. Don't do that. Uh, it doesn't matter what you do. Do not do that. Just what I recommend is mowing your yard after a good rain, maybe even a day after the rain, just to let that water kind of soak into the plant and let it recover a little bit, and then mow it. That's what you need to be doing as far as mowing during the summer. Okay, cultural practices. I've seen some things on YouTube and posted online of people scalping, dethatching, airification. Airification is a little bit. I'll get more on that in a minute. You want to really mess up your grass, please scalp it while it's really, really stressed. That's dumb. I've been doing this 30 years. I'm an agronomist. That's dumb. It's just that simple. I, I don't mean to be rude. It's just, come on, man. Th that is the equivalent of having somebody with a 110 fever and going out and telling them, hey, go out and run a mile as fast as you can in 98 degree weather. That's the equivalent. Probably not going to last very long. Probably keel over dead. Do not scalp your yard. Dethatching. That is a summer preparation activity, if you will. If you need to do it, and probably don't need to do it, you need about a half inch of thatch on your yard anyway. Don't dispute me. Any university will tell you the same thing. You need about a half inch of thatch on your yard. Just to push in that crown that I just went over a little bit, you don't need, if you have no thatch in your yard, you're better off with about a half inch of it. So don't, de and if you want to dethatch your yard, do it in the fall or in the spring. Do not do it during the summer. You're just going to stress it. As far as verification, now, two different types of verification we're talking about here. We're talking about taking a core out. Um, now, I will say on golf course greens, I did airify. I would go out and I would spike them during the summer with a slicer or a very tiny little spike. Okay, I'm talking quarter inch or less, uh, periodically, sometimes every week if it was really stressed. Um, but I was irrigating. And I was also careful of taking a vehicle over turf when it's hot. I generally went out right after I irrigated in the morning, hit it real good, and got the devil off the green. Okay? Spiking will allow, it will allow oxygen exchange between the air and the ground enough to where it's not increasing your, evapo -tran your, 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 trans your, your, your evaporation rate. I'll get into evapotranspiration here in a minute. So the oxygen exchange is a good thing. If you go into the airification, taking out a core, like I talked about in the airification video, it gets a little too much. Reason being is, is now you've taken it out, and now that grass or the water from that soil really starts to come out, and your evaporation goes upward. If you are irrigating your yard, like I did a golf green, you could probably get away with it. If you think you're going to go out and airify your yard, and you are not irrigating your yard, and it's going to improve your grass, I can tell you it ain't you are going to make it worse. There again, the best thing you can do for the most part this time of year is nothing. And for golly Ned's sake, do not thatch, do not, uh, definitely don't scalp, never scalp your yard. Uh, and be careful about airification. You can spike it, that's fine. Fertilization. I saw a YouTube video, a uh, guy was trying to convince folks to fertilize during the summer and how it was not harmful. Um, okay, let's let's talk about this for just a second. The practicality of it. If you if it is dry, the fertilizer you put out has to be in suspension, meaning has, there has to be moisture in the soil for that plant to take it up. As we went over, the plant is shutting down. Not only is it shutting down the the the, the leaf, it's also shutting down the roots. It ain't taking anything up. Summer, uh, grass going into summer dormancy is not taking up nutrients because it's not taking anything. Up. It's going into dormancy. And it's watering out, watering, once when you achieve summer dormancy, watering yourself out of it is almost impossible. It just is. Uh, once when you get there, it almost is. I, I, I can honestly say, I, I think once when it gets there, it, the plant, in my opinion, the turf, I don't have scientists, you know, I probably could find something to really look for. I'm just telling you my 30 years of experience here. If you're trying to water it out, it's one going to take a long time, but in my opinion, that 
that turf shuts down and it is both temperature and day length dependent. That's my opinion because actually in nature you actually see that plants and animals uh, base things on day length. I was watching Alone the other night and there was actually a rabbit up in the Arctic that actually due to day length changes its color from brown to white in the winter based on day length. Uh, I would not be surprised if that is the case with the turf. Um, we seeded a green in Cary, North Carolina, at Prestwood Country Club, right outside of Raleigh in July. USGA perfect soil, uh, perfect ir brand new irrigation system. We could not get anything to go. We could not get anything to pop. The bent grass would not come up until September. Grass knows when to grow. So you are likely not going to water yourself out of dormancy. It's just probably not going to happen. Um, and you're going to waste a lot of water trying to do it. So that is something you need to keep in mind as far as fertilization. You're not going to water out of it. You're not going to fertilize out of it. That is just not going to happen. In addition with fertilization, there is, if there's a nitrogen application in, and probably is, and you're trying to grow your grass. Grass is not going to grow because it's shutting down. It's not, there's no solution there for it to be in solution. And three, you're also putting a soluble salt down on your, on your uh, grass. Uh, I actually saw a person on YouTube say, oh, it's fine. It's on the leaf blade. It won't hurt it. It's a soluble salt. Urea is a soluble salt. If you leave, as I said in my fertilization video, if you leave that bag open, particularly during the summer, don't believe me, do it. Leave a bag open, don't tape it. Go back about two weeks and see if it's, it's a solid brick because it has actually pulled the moisture out of the air. You haven't watered it. It actually pulled it out of the air. It'll pull it all out of that leaf blade too if you don't get watered in. If you fertilize, and I'm not recommending fertilizing in July or August, you should, you know, should do that in the spring in preparation and late and early, early summer in preparation for this time of year. Right now we're just cruising. So fertilization is not going to do you a whole lot of good. Now, as far as something else. Now, I do have Bermuda grass. The Yukon Bermuda that I have, and I'm doing a lot of research on this because I'm really looking into it, and I'm going to do an iron application video, and it's primarily going to be probably geared towards cool season grass folks that are probably not under stress, and definitely warm season grass guys that are kind of like me, uh, you know, what, what we've got out there can handle this stress, and they want to get a little bit of summer color. You can put iron applications out. My and the reason being is I did put um, iron sulfate out in putting greens. I put it in my spray tank and it did work very well and it did color things. But I wanted to get more in depth and find out what actually does work and not, what does not work. I will say foliar applications, just to kind of like a preview, foliar applications of nitrogen do work very well. Um, and they will give you good color. Depending on the and it needs to be a chelated iron. If it's non-chelated, it's not going to be available to the plant. And you need a high percentage of chelated iron in that uh, in that iron product that you're putting out. And research needs to find trying to find ones that are the best. Um, there are a few on Amazon that actually look like they work pretty well. But you want a chelated iron. You want to put it out with a fuller application. You probably should put a surfactant in with it. Uh, that's to evenly distribute it on the leaf blade. Follow the label instructions of what product you choose, but that will actually green things up without putting a, a salt out, okay? Um, there is a little possibility. You might get a little kickback as far as fungal control because it's an iron sulfate. Sulfur actually is gives you a little bit of fungal control. I'm not saying that that's... But that's, that, that sulfur is a treatment for fungus. A little bit. So there's a lot of advantages to using iron in the summer if 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 it's not going to bring you out of summer dormancy. In fact, if you do have summer dormancy and you put an iron product out and your grass is greener, where it's dormant is going to look worse. <laughs> because you're going to have this really green fescue, for example, and the blue grass you have in your yard or the rye grass or fine fescue you have in your yard is going to be straw color and that's not going to help. So anyway. You can put an iron application. Fungicide applications. Wind is blowing and it is going to be 93 degrees today. That is nasty. Anyway. Um, hard for turf. 
you're really, I mean, this, the evap, you know, water's, I can hear the water evaporating off the turf right now. Anyway, so fungicide applications. They have to get in what you have available for home lawn use has to get into the plant. Okay. If there is not enough soil water for that plant to uptake it, and if it's not in a state that it allows that, if it is shut down, it is really not going to get in that plant very effectively. So you really need, one, these need to be lower on the leaf plate, because as I said in my home fungicide video, they have to be down on the plant because they only translocate to the plant going upward through the xylem, not down through the phloem. Okay? So you need to keep that in mind. This is the tricky part as far as fungal control. Generally, if it's dry, really dry, you shouldn't have a whole lot of fungal pressure. It is when it's wet is when you have fungal pressure. Granted, humidity can play a role in this. So when you do your fungicide applications, you ideally want to do them right after a rain and you need to get them lower on the leaf blade with spray volume and or for the granular water it in so it goes up through the roots and it's taken up. If you put it out and you do not water it in or the plant is shut down or it is growing slowly because it's kind of shutting down, it's not going to be very effective. Just keep that in mind. You really don't have a choice. If you have fungal pressure on your yard, you're going to have to get something out. You may have to end up irrigating it yourself or just go with it. What you lose is what you lose and just wait for the next rain. So anyway, just keep that in mind with fungal control. But when your grass starts browning, don't start throwing fungicides everywhere. Evaluate it. See my fungicide video. I show you how to identify fungus probably in July and August, particularly if it's straw color and it's irregular large shape, large shape. You get straw color with dollar spot, as I went over. But if it's an irregular large shape, it's probably summer dormancy. Just keep that in mind. Okay, when to water and how much to water? When to water and why? Water in the morning. The reason being is if you water in the evening or even midnight, one o'clock in the morning, whatever you want to set your timer to, if you have an irrigation system, fortunate to have one, you want to water really prior to sun up. Reason being is, is you want that turf canopy to be dry as long as possible because that will reduce your fungal pressure. If you go into the night, you irrigate and that, and that turf is wet all night long, you're going to have increased fungal pressure, particularly with pythium and, and really a whole bunch of other ones. Pythium in particular is what I'm mentioning is because it actually, it actually moves with water. It doesn't move with air or traffic. It moves with water. It does move with traffic a little bit, but it does move with water. So you want to water just prior to sun up. The also reason you want to do it then, you would be shocked at how much water, if you have dew, I'd say you guys at West probably don't even have dew, but if you have dew in the morning, you would be very surprised at how long you have got to run your irrigation system, how much water is stored by the turf canopy and the thatch layer. Because at the end of the day, we want the water getting into that soil profile, right? That is where our water is being held, is in that soil profile. Just like this tub, our, that's our tub of water. This is our plant available water. That's what this represents. Okay, We want that to get into there and get into that soil. So do it in the morning. You are going to get the benefit of that dew being out there and you're not watering that. The water you're putting on, saving water, is actually getting into the soil by doing it in the morning. Now, evapotranspiration rate, what in the devil is that? Evapo, meaning the evaporation, and transpo, meaning the transpiration in the plant. This varies from plant to plant to plant, to almost different species, etc. Now, there is a calculation that I used to do back in the day, and I've since lost the formula. It was something that I learned in plant, I think it was plant physiology class that I had. And you plugged in, it was a calculation, you plugged in the crop, okay, because we have crop science courses in my agronomy degree. So anyway, you plugged in your crop and it gave you the evapotranspiration rate. That's how much actually the plant was using and how much. And it's also based on temperature, humidity, soil texture. Okay. That gives you the reserve of what it is. Uh, for instance, sand, sand has very little reserve. Clay has a higher reserve because it's a finer particle size. 
it does vary based on the sole texture. Okay, I'm not going to get too much into that. What I want, I just want to get hit hit the main points here. So anyway, the thing is, there is a, and I think university have stepped off of this. It used to be back in the day, infrequent and deep. Now, <laughs> you really need to replenish what you have lost in evapotranspiration during that day. Now, how much is that? Most publications I've seen has been an inch a week. I would argue if, it, when I calculate in Raleigh, North Carolina, when I was on those putting greens, doing that calculation, this time of year in July, we were losing a quarter inch of water per day. Now, when it's windy like this, that can go up. When it's cloudy, that can go down. But generally, in July, Raleigh, North Carolina, you are losing on a bent grass putting green a quarter inch of water per day. So what you have to do is for every bit of water that you lose during the day, you need to replenish at night. So you need to put down a quarter inch. Generally, most publications that I've seen for home lawns, it is different for home lawns. Get something else on mowing here in a minute. I already talked about mowing. You need to replenish how much you are losing per day. Most publications say an inch a week. Depending on where you are, a day like this, it's probably going to be higher. You really need to put out, don't base it on minutes, Run your irrigation system, put some tuna cans out there, sardine cans or something shallow. Run your irrigation system for at least 10 minutes, ideally 20. That gives you how much water you were putting out for every 10 minutes, for every 20 minutes, and then you can calculate accordingly. Um, and you may have to play with it a little bit. But I would say if you're putting out an inch... For those of you out west, probably an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half a week. Calculate that in. Be aware when you get rain events, that should get you through. But you have to replenish. I don't encourage you to go in frequent and deep. I encourage you to, every evening, put back what you've lost during the day. Okay, this is my yard. It is Bermuda grass. It is specifically Yukon Bermuda grass. I want to talk a little bit about species and cultivars as far as your selection. And this is a pretty good eye, this is a pretty good time of year to evaluate exactly what you want to do as far as going into the fall or maybe even next spring and maybe change a few things. Now, why I choose Bermuda grass? This is specifically Yukon Bermuda grass, which is extremely cold tolerant cultivar of Bermuda grass. And I, there again, I'm in West Virginia northern part. I probably have one of the more northern Bermuda grass lawns in the country. Yes, it goes dormant about the time of Halloween. Yes, it looks funny during the winter because I'm probably the only one that has it. However, this time of year, it pays dividends. Now, let's talk about as far as um, grass selection of going into of if you, if you want to change it, cool season grasses, you're probably going to go do it this fall. Maybe warm season grasses, you probably do it late August, September, but I always recommend maybe late spring for switching around as far as putting it, switching around warm season grasses. Now, I have not done any fungicide. I've not done any irrigation. I don't even have to put grub control out on this. So that's how important species selection is because you're really going to increase your inputs one way or the other of what you want to do. As far as cool season grasses, I recommend tall fescue. Specifically, there's actually a three-way blend of tall fescue called Artemis. I have a seed selection video that goes over the National Turfgrass Evaluation Program. That is a program done by universities across the country. Actually, North America includes a few Canadian universities that grow different species of turf grass, and they also grow different cultivars and evaluate them based on quality, disease resistance, water uh, tolerance or drought tolerance, and various overall and overall quality. 
that is where I always tell folks to go to as far as evaluating what turf species to actually grow in our yard to reduce the costs and to have a nice yard when really at the end of the day you want it. I don't mind the dormancy on Bermuda. So the most tolerant is tall fescue and cool season grasses as far as drought, fungus, I recommend tall fescue. A lot of folks like bluegrass. The only thing about bluegrass is it is a high maintenance grass. You're going to have to water it and the high, it's going to be very high as far as fungus uh, control. You're going to have to be vigilant on it. Rye grass and fine fescue, as far as rye grass, rye grass is kind of in between bluegrass and tall fescue. It has decent drought tolerance. It has decent fungal tolerance, but it's sort of in the middle. The nice thing about ryegrass is, is you can basically put it out and it germinates in seven days. I actually had ryegrass on this yard and I was reasonably happy with it, but I finally went to Bermuda because I just wanted to have, to be honest with you, some of it was an experiment, but it worked out pretty doggone well for me. Now, as far as warm season grasses, Bermuda is going to be your most heat tolerant. It's going to be your most drought tolerant, and particularly you in the Southwest, it's probably the only way to fly. Um, there is also zoysia grass. It's sort of the bluegrass of warm season grasses, meaning not so much on fungal issues. It does get spring dead spot pretty well. However, it is not the greatest as far as drought tolerance. So do keep that in mind. St. Augustine grass, the nice thing about St. Augustine is it is highly shade tolerant. So if you're wanting, if you have a lot of shade in your yard or, now granted, the leaf texture is quite a difference between Bermuda grass and St. Augustine, but you can do like I have done in my yard. I've actually had cool season grasses underneath my um, maple tree and I have Bermuda grass because it doesn't perform well in, in, in shaded environments. I have um, fescue there, Bermuda grass where, and <clears throat> Bermuda grass in the sun area. You can always do St. Augustine if you have a shady yard and that does pretty good. The leaf blade's a little wide for my liking, but it's a good grass. Also, centipede is probably in the middle there as well. The thing about, uh, pardon me, centipede and St. Augustine is you gotta watch what herbicide you put on it because it's very particular what you can and cannot put on St. Augustine. And I've gone through over through that in some of my videos of what you can and cannot do with St. Augustine and centipede. So anyway, this is a good time to evaluate the direction you wanna go. See my overseeding video, particularly you cool season grass folks, gives you an idea what direction to go. One last thing about mowing, and I'm kind of summing up here. Raise your mowing height, particularly cool season grass folks, raise your mowing height. That is going to increase the shade on, the, on your soil and the turf canopy in general. It's going to reduce the evaporation rate off of that, and it's not going to stress the grass. Plus, it is also going to give you better weed control. Crabgrass, those of you who have crabgrass right now, Look underneath your shade tree. See how much crabgrass you have there. Probably none. The reason being is, is crabgrass needs the sun to germinate. If you have deeper, this is why I increased my weed pressure on my yard because I went from two inch, two and a half inch high to cut down to an inch and a quarter. I had more weeds this year. I had a tree. So do keep that in mind. Mowing is a pretty important thing. But take away some this. Don't overmanage your yard. I, I am just appalled. Yeah, I'm appalled. <laughs> At what people are trying to do their yard, I, you know, it's grass, folks. Um, granted, I'm, I'm the goofball that went into college and learned how to manage it, but it's not that hard. And you can make life hard on you by overmanaging it. And it's, it's you know, it's kind of like it's football. It's block, basic blocking and tackling. Defense wins championships, blah, blah, blah. Um, don't get over fancy. Don't get over aggressive, particularly this time of year. And just do things and chill. And... If you're not going to irrigate your yard, take a deep cleansing breath. I'm going into summer dormancy. I'm going to water my yard once every 14 days with a half inch of water. Keep it alive and go into the fall and I'm good to go. So anyway, if you subscribe and hit the bell, you will get these videos and I will give you a heads up on what you need to be doing. Um, it encourage you to subscribe to the channel if you like please like. It helps and throws my videos higher up into the search, and it might help someone else. And that's actually what I want to do. I'm here to help you, not necessarily to give you the latest hack, roll my eyes, or whatever. 
hey, basic blocking and tackling here. I'm just trying to help give you the benefits of what I've seen over the last 30 years and some of the things, actually almost 35 years now, and some of the things of what I've seen. I really appreciate the feedback, and I like the fact that you guys are seeing that my channel is a little different than most. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not necessarily here to entertain, not. Um, I'm here to educate. And you guys take what you can out of it. I encourage you. There are other good YouTubers out there. I don't mean to rag on people. It's just some of this stuff is... I, I just hate to see you lose grass. Uh, you guys got families. You guys got stuff to do. And now somebody's telling you to do something that's actually going to, one, waste your money, two, waste your time, and two, three, not meet the goals that you want. And that's a that's the goal of this channel is to get you where you need to go. So anyway, I'm agronomist Greg Phillips. Thanks for watching. See you next time. And I think it's going to be on Iron Applications in summer.